I need thee every hour. 483. Good to see everybody here this Sabbath, and what a beautiful day it is. Let's have opening prayer. <clears throat> Father, we want to thank you for a beautiful Sabbath day. We ask that you'll, your blessings will be on this day. We pray for those who are not here, and be with them, and, their, and bring them back. We want to thank you for your plan of salvation and your life upon Calvary and your guidance in our lives. Pray for our little church in Miles City, Montana and every member in it, Father. Please guide and direct our footsteps in your pathway of light. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath. How many of you know where the Los Plateau is? The Los Plateau is a huge plateau ne right next to the Gobi Desert that spans all across China. And there's areas around the edge of it that are just like the redwoods. They're verdant, they're full of running water, rocks and everything. But the main part of it has been grazed down to just bear dirt by the goats and sheep that the people raised there. And a few years back, China took on a massive reconstruction project in it. 
that in, part of it involved, first of all, they borrowed $500 million from the World Bank to do this. But they took and uh, worked with the local people and made them pen up their goats. If you wanted to feed your goats, you had to bring the feed to them. You couldn't turn them loose and let them denude everything. And if you can imagine pulling that on a farming community, that it would be quite a change, quite a bit of, what are we going to do? You can't do this to us. But in China, they can, and they did. And now when you go there, the population has doubled or tripled. It's a, the springs have come back to life. There's trees planted. What they did is they terraced the whole region with terraces at least 10, 12 feet deep. And it just brought the whole place back. There's a truck farming is a big industry there and everything, all because they were willing to sacrifice. The difference between a sacrifice and an offering is whether you can really afford it and trust God to make up the difference. So think about the use of words in that as we take up the offering today. Will the usher come forward? Dear kind Heavenly Father, as we just return a small portion to you of the amount that you've blessed us with, we ask that you will bless us with your spirit. Watch this money go to wherever it is needed. Bless the gift. Bless the giver. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture is from Psalm 5110. Psalms 5110. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Okay, it's on. Okay. I suppose that we should get to the closing hymn, but right before that, I'd like to share something with you, if I may. Now, before I do that, though, let's get into some prayer so that I can be eloquent in spite of myself. <sighs> Dear Lord, I want to thank you for this day today, just for the opportunity to come here and to worship you, and I pray that as we go into this message, I pray that you'll, you know, that your words that I speak will be your words that will be clear, and that what I say here will be something that we can something that you want us to hear and that we can take with us in our walk going forward. 
pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so a little, little fun fact I, when I was looking up some things on the internet was that apparently there's a lot of people that profess to be followers of Christ. About If you count all the denominations, there's about 2.5 billion. And at least in the mainstream Christianity, the one thing that everybody believes is that you know, Jesus saves, or in a sense, saves us from our sins. I say that's actually a very important aspect of it and should no way be diminished. But, you know, if I was to pinpoint the overall theme of the Bible, I'd only have one particular word that would come to my mind. And reckon, yeah, the word would be reconciliation. Now, of course, at one time, the concept of confess, confession and forgiveness was all that Christians were told to focus on. In the sense that the duty was to basically focus on penance through confession and was no often through a priest. And again, I will say, while that's important, reconciliation is more than pardon. In fact, when you look at it in the dictionary, it means to basically become friendly, to become friendly once again. While forgiveness is a part of that, there's also other things that need to be done as well. Yeah. And reconciliation in this case ultimately results in returning to a working relationship with God. Basically, to the extent that Adam and Eve had before their fall. Now, aside from confession and forgiveness, oh, all right. Now, and the thing is, unlike what some people do believe that, when some people might believe about God being hard-hearted, he's actually quite open to coming and working with you. And it says in on the screen behind me, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him, will sup with him, and he with me. Now, confession and forgiveness is one aspect. Another aspect involves dialogue. Now, the two don't necessarily have to go in that order. They can happen simultaneously or one before the other. And examples of dialogue are, of course, throughout the Bible. I've got listed here, Abraham was a good example. How many times he talked with God in the middle of the night about things. Moses and the burning bush is another great example. And then every prophet in the Old Testament from Elijah to Jeremiah or Chronicles having some sort of dialogue with him. And again, a back and forth conversation, not just talking at him. So those are, I would say that there are three goals, ultimate goals to reconciliation. And confession, forgiveness, and dialogue are two of them, but the third one is one that I want to illustrate on today. Yeah. And for the illustration, I'll be picking up on one particular character, and that be David. Now, David is actually one of the is actually a very good example of of a working relationship with God, which, if you whether you look in the Psalms or even in the chronicles of his life in First, Second Samuel. He's got one of the best displays of dialogue where he continually shares things like his praises and his petitions. And he pretty much leaves everything out on the table. You know, one example I can think of where he actually shows him with an active dialogue with God about how to do 
about what to do would be his decision following the death of Saul. He asks him, where do I go? God tells him, go up unto Hebron. And then he goes. Just little things like that everywhere. And the second part of that is how his, uh, well, he repents of his sins regularly. At least you see him taking responsibility for his actions. Although, that being said, he wasn't the most stellar in terms of his performance. Now, of course, that's not to say there is no reason that he was referred to as a man after God's own heart you know, in both in 1 Samuel and in the book of Acts. But uh, as we know, Scripture says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So. Now, of course, we know that his worst mistake by far would have been the sin with Bathsheba and then the subsequent cover-up behind that, which resulted in the death of Uriah. We also know that from Psalms 32 and 51 that he takes up his dialogue with God once again in the usual manner, confessing and asking for forgiveness. But then he also, in exercising the first of those two principles of reconciliation, he ends up uncovering the third principle. See, the... It can be best illustrated in verse 10 of Psalm 51, which reads, uh, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now me, I kind of... That sounds nice just reading it straight out, but to get a full understanding behind the principle, two things that are, are helpful to understand, and one is the context of what he's saying, and then also the actual meaning in the original language. Now to start, now to start with, we'll go through a summary of his past mistakes. Just kind of get an idea of what those mistakes were like, and then we talk about the sin with Bathsheba. Now for the first mistake I can think of in particular would be the slaying of the priests at Nob which is the lead up to that is in 1 Samuel 21 and verses 1 to 9 and then chapters 22 and 9 through 23 where he goes where he actually talks about the tragedy and what he learned about afterwards now for the sake of time I'll probably just be going over these in summary so there won't be a lot of scripture reading for this Anyway, so as we know through in First Samuel 21, we know that at that point he's already on the run from Saul and he's not totally apt to trust anybody at this point. And in doing so, he ends up not being able to trust God as he should. So when he goes up to the temple or to the tabernacle, he goes up to the priest Ahimelech under the guise of, I'm on a secret mission on behalf of Saul, and I need some provisions and a weapon if you have any. Of course, they tell him, it's interesting, they tell him, of course, that the only bread that they have is the show bread, the hallowed bread, as he says. He says, it was interesting, it says they can only give it to him on the condition that, you know, he's been away from women for a while. As you know, he was recently married at the time, so that's technically two deceptions. But then, yes, so he does that, thinks that nobody's going to see him. However, a sheep herd by the name of Doag notices him and then reports it to Saul. And then we know from the following chapter that Doeg reports this to Saul 
And Saul comes up and asks, why did you do that? And of course, the priest is left completely unaware. And he's like, well, you said that he was on your bidding. So we were just doing according to our duty. And then he, Saul was not still not too pleased about that. And of course, he had the priest slayed. Of course, the son of Biathar, excuse me, the son of Ahimelech, that Biathar, escapes, manages to tell Saul what happened. I mean, tell David. David, excuse me. David would. And David, of course, says, I knew at that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all persons of thy father's house. So again, again, you can see him admitting that what he did was wrong. Now the second instance I want to think of too is where he sought refuge with the Philistines. And this is, would be in 1 Samuel 27. Now with now this time when he seeks refuge, he gives it he gives the impression that he is an ally now of the king of the Philistines at the time who was Achish. And as he and he sets up shop in a town known as Ziklag. Now while he does this, he decides to fulfill his duty as a king what would have been his duty as king of Israel by fighting the other enemies of Israel at the time. Now when he does this, he goes, he will of course go out to raid them. The funny thing is once he, he wouldn't leave anyone alive to tell anyone what happened. And when Achish would ask him what he did, he would of course say, I went against Israel that day. So it's, so continually setting himself up for, as a friend. Now this almost comes to a head with him when he, you know, when Achish decides to move against Israel, because he calls up people to go fight, and of course David, being now the loyal friend that he is, is called up with them, all the men. So at the time David's probably now sweating bullets, thinking, "What have I got myself into?" And luckily, the other Philistine princes, as they say, were said, you know what, we don't want to risk him turning against us in battle, so let him go home. Nakish, you know, perhaps reluctantly agrees. Now, it's interesting, though, is because even though Achish didn't know what he was up to, the other nations that David had been moving against, they still knew what, who had done it and where he was at the time. And because he, he had been called away, with all his fighting men, the city where he was left was left defenseless. And as a result of that, he ended up being, having all the women and kids and everything taken at the time. And shortly after, the, and, uh, and you know the rest of the story, they ended up pursuing and overtaking them. I'd like to say, while I don't see a necessary thing where he outright says what he did, although I'm sure that to go out he, well, it was shortly after that he would have had to, Saul died and he pretty much went back to Israel. So I'm guessing it wouldn't be too hard to suspect he would, he decided that that was it. Now the second, and then the third example I have is transporting the ark, the ark of the covenant on the ox cart. And of course, you know from the, now as God mandated in the books of Moses, the tavern, the ark was supposed to be carried on the shoulders of Colethites, I believed. It was also only, it was also only allowed to be seen and touched by the descendants of Aaron. Now, of course, in doing the first act of 
putting on the cart, thinking about bringing the ark into Jerusalem in splendor. It ended up opening up the second offense in which when the ox cart either hit a bump or I'm not sure what happened, but the ark seemed like it was about to fall and the man guiding the oxen named Uzzah thought, you know, oh, I better study this quick and the second he touched it, you know, Now, of course, of course, it says at first that David was angry at this, but then after a few months later, after they leave the ark in there, it says that he feared God. He some, probably had time to look back and see what he did wrong. And we know that as he brought back the ark the right way, he was basically worshiping the whole way back. Now, some char- now, there are some characteristics of these sins that, while I'm not, say, well, I'm not to say that sin is any better or worse than, I mean, while I'm not to say that these sins are necessarily any better or worse than the, in, term, in the sight of God, I will say that there are some characteristics that make these different than with the sin with Bathsheba. For one thing, there's a few of them that could be influ- that you could say be influenced by a lack of faith, particularly the first two. You know, because David still had, still was still going about believing that he was doing things for God, or he had the right intentions, but took about his own methods. Also, they're not necessarily they weren't necessarily self serving sins either, at least not purely. I say not purely because of course there is I say not purely. I say not purely because even though it wasn't necessarily selfish, I mean there was some there was, you could say there was a little bit of self-serving in there too because he's looking to preserve his own life in a couple instances. And of course, like I mentioned, he took responsibility for his actions, if not immediately, then shortly thereafter, at least. Now, and that, of course, brings us to the sin of, with Bathsheba, which is accounted in for in Second Samuel 11. Now, now you know, at this time, there's war... There's war again with the Ammonites. And at this time, David, who's usually been on the front lines of things, has went to stay home. And perhaps in the middle of the night, somewhere in the middle of the night, he goes out to basically walk around maybe for some fresh air. As he's doing this, he looks over and sees well, it says in verse 2 that from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. The, verse 3, and David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? That's funny. He sees the woman, he inquires after her, but then, and they tell him, oh yeah, she's we know her, she's the wife of Uriah. It's funny, he knows this, but then, as we know, as we understand, he pretty much decides to meet her that night. And on that small moment, I'm sure later on he's thinking very much how he, later on he'd probably think about how much he acted like Saul 
to take just up and take something because he wanted it. At this time, he's probably thinking to himself, I sent her the deed's done, I sent her away, nothing's going to happen. And then lo and behold, a short time later, you know, in verse 5 it says, And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now, of course, oops. You know. so, so now that he's looking to, now that his reputation and perhaps the reputation of Israel is looking to be sullied, he decides to cover it up rather than to enter into his dialogue. So now the, which leads to the first and the first two attempts to cover it up involve trying to send his her husband Uriah home, so that people will think, of course, maybe he was the father. Now the first attempt. He tries to send him home and then finds out later Uriah stayed with the servants and he's like, why did you not go home? I gave you a free pass. And the guy tells him, well, the ark sits in a tent. Everybody else is out in the battlefield. If you know, Why should I go home and enjoy the comforts that I have? And then the second attempt, he tries to persuade him to do it again. This time, actually, as it says, whining and dining him until he was in a little bit of a stupor. And that somehow, even, in, even someone intoxicated, he still does the same thing as before and goes to bed with the servants. course the final and then of course we have the final successful attempt in which in which David sends Uriah or sends Joab a messenger saying this is in verse 14 15 excuse me he says or he said and he wrote in the letter saying Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. Which, of course, as we know, that attempt is successful, and then he, after Bathsheba's done mourning, he takes her to, as his wife, being the nice guy that he is. And then, you know, after, and then she gives birth to the child, and all seems to be well. Now, uh, what makes this sin different from the other ones? Honestly, the three, the three elements that I can think of are, in this time around, he has absolutely no excuse. He can't. He can't say that I was doing the wrong thing for the right reasons. You know, and it was purely the result of selfish desires. And for the guy who's, for who all the Psalms, or majority of the Psalms talk, are of him talking with God and laying everything out, it's easy to suspect that he spent maybe a year perhaps long, a little longer, hiding the truth and pretending that nothing had happened. You know, it's, there are a lot of horrible things in the world, but to do those things and pretend that you're righteous, that's certainly something that God doesn't care to keep care for. And of course, after this, we know in chapter 12, Nathan comes to visit him. Maybe at this point, David's not suspecting anything. Maybe he's a little, little concerned, but decide, but doesn't, but shrugs it off. Then Nathan pretty much tells him, we know the story. He tells him, so there's a man who had many sheep, and then there was a poor man that only had one. And he took the, 
You know, the rich man, when he had a guest, decided to take this lamb, take the poor man's lamb instead of one of his home and prepare it. And of course, David, I'd like to think that David didn't suspect anything because, or see the parallel because immediately he's angry at the sound of this and says, the man should die and pay fourfold because he didn't have mercy or pity. To which Nathan says, thou art the man. So now at this point, this is where David realizes what he's done and pleads for cha change in his own life. Yes. Now we'll turn to Psalm 51. Now, start off with he'll go through the usual. He'll go through the usual rounds of confessing and asking for forgiveness. So, in, starting in verse one, verse three, it says here, "Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions." Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. And in verse 4, he acknowledges that sin is ultimately against God. When he says, against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Now, then in the following verses, he has sort of a lead up. He starts leading up to verse 10, or the idea that's going to be presented in verse 10. Or in verse 6, he says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make, known, make me to know wisdom. And then verses seven and nine start getting into start getting into it even more. They purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Then hide my face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Now it's interesting, hyssop, if you read in the Old Testament, you know, sacrificial ceremonies and hyssop is sort of used as sort of a purging as a symbol of purging something and of course now brings us out to once again so what does the verse mean okay so as we know, so to create in me a clean heart. Now, now I'm taking these from the Strong's Concordance. I don't have the exact entries listed, but essentially, what they these are the meanings here. To create the word behind that means to create out of nothing, which is something we know only God can do. Now, a clean heart, the heart referring to the inner parts, basically the emotions and personality, who you are, your soul, in one word. If you have a clean heart, that means it's been freed from the influence of sin. And then, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, renew means either to rebuild or to repair. And then a right spirit is the word behind, wearing behind that was tricky, but essentially it talks about an established spirit. See, I underlined the S 
because it's like it's referring to the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit. And to have it within me means essentially the whole being. So if we are to take all the trans all the translations behind the words and try to paraphrase it into something that conveys the deep meaning. The idea this is pretty much how I would state it right here. Where David is asking, remake my soul into something pure and repair that place in me where your spirit is established. So essentially that so again, the three goals of reconciliation, confession and forgiveness and dialogue make up the first two. The third one is what David asks for now, and that is essentially transforming of the character. Now, again, now again, recognizing the need for a savior is something that every most Christians, at least here in America, will agree with. But although but the thing is, and then we should celebrate that every day. In some ways, I think that sometimes evangelicals are better at celebrating that than we are here. But celebrating it and merely relying on confession and forgiveness isn't enough by itself. Also, we shouldn't rely on acting in a certain way, because as you know, Christ called the Pharisees, who in their time were considered the most righteous, to be whitewashed tombs. Or in the parable of the unjust judge, where the judge did his job, but only because he didn't want to be bothered. So ultimately, the end result of having that continual dialogue with God is to have that change, which is something that only he can do. Now, it's interesting. And again, God does say that he will do this. He doesn't leave us stone cold. Now, in Psalm 32, the companion to Psalm 51, where David goes through asking essentially the same exact thing. God responds to him. He says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Essentially, you've asked for it, and I will be the one to take you through it. Of course, the idea isn't just limited to the Old Testament. It says it Nice thing about the New Testament that it says these things in quite plainly. Like in Romans 6, 11 and 12 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. And then in verse 14 it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Then Romans 12 and verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then finally, Ephesians 4, 22-24. Put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So, so now that we've said all this, can we say that something changed for David? Now, I would like to believe that something did change for David after that. Not everything, but certain things did. 
Now we know that one thing that was a constant or a constant temptation in his life were, you know, women in general. You know, he took on more than one wife and we know that he had several concubines. Following the rebellion of Absalom, it says that he essentially he kind of, he put away the concubines in a sense. Now he didn't like throw them out of the house. He continued to take care of them, but he never engaged with them after that. And I like to. Th I don't know if that was strictly a part of an honor code either because of what Absalom did, but we do know that. But I like. But there's evidence too that it was still a character change because he never took on another concubine. In fact, when Abishag, the young lady, was called a nurse on him, it says specifically that he did not know her. So, of course, uh, a cloud of witnesses, the phrase is taken from Hebrews 12 and verse 1, where after listing all the all the examples in the Old Testament of people walking in faith. It says, where that we have such a great cloud of witnesses, let us put aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset us. And of course, David is a great example, but he's not the only one. You know, if we look throughout the Bible, we'll see these continually. I think and pray that we continue to look at these examples and draw something from them that, you know, that, in a sense, we can end up maybe being a cloud of witnesses for the people in our day. Yeah, and that, I'm afraid, and that's all I have. All right, now if you please stand as we sing our closing hymn, number 290. which is uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, number 290.
close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for being able to come here once again. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with us, that you'll be with us the rest of this day, that we'll be able to rest in you. I pray that every day we rest in you to have a dialogue and open ourselves completely for to be refashioned for your glory. That we might be able to share you with others and hasten your coming. In Jesus' name, amen.